Today on Would You Believe It, meet a coven of witches practicing their magic in a secret location. Hear the incredible story of a collection of dinosaur tracks and the man who thought they were made by giant turkeys. See the ingenious techniques of generations of smugglers. Travel to the house in the woods, which is one big work of art. Visit the strange, the bizarre, and the unexpected on Would You Believe It? Witches. Their terrifying image is universal. Creatures with wizened features, preying on the innocent, using their dark magic with evil intent. But here in the magical lands of Cornwall, England, witches have a home where they will always be welcome. For here, behind the peaceful exterior of Boss Castle, a modern day coven has survived centuries of persecution to offer witches a safe haven. The citizens of England have never been sympathetic to their kind, repelled by fearful legends of these grotesque monsters. During one 18-year period in the 1600s alone, over 4,000 men, women, and children were slaughtered for this serious crime. Fearsome instruments like this torture chair were used in witch trials, inflicting horrific injury and death to anyone even thought to be a witch. Public hysteria led to witches suffering some of the most extreme punishments ever devised, like this merciless rack. Witch finders, who feigned magical witch-smelling skills, traveled the country placing suspects in cages, instantly sentencing the accused to terrible fates. Mass hangings, beheadings, and public disembowelments were among the most common means of disposing of those unfortunates. So it seems incredible to have caught two such beasts on camera in present-day England casting incantations in broad daylight. But these witches don't wear black. Their broomsticks have been replaced by a far less audacious mode of transport. And they never, ever wear pointy hats. Graham King, on the left, however, does own a cat. He and Rod St. Barb are modern witches. Having moved with the times, the ceremony they are about to perform doesn't involve newts or stolen hair, and there's not a cauldron in sight. We're making a protection charm here for a house and its occupants. In fact, witchcraft is so advanced now, you don't even have to be female to be a witch. As Wiccans, they've come up here to summon spirits from the earth and the soul of the wood. Oh, ye mighty ones of the east, lords of air, we ask that you be with us and that you bless this charm bag, that it may protect both the house and its occupants. And we thank you and to thank the spirits for all their good work. An offering of bread to the tree and its spirits. Thank you, tree. Thank you, tree. After thousands of years of bad press, Graham is seeking to charm public opinion by opening an exhibit displaying his collection of mysterious witchcraft memorabilia. Inside, many of the more ghastly items collected from real-life witches are revealed for the first time. Like this decaying hanged frog, used by a witch to protect her home against black magic aimed at her. And this skull, still containing the spirit of its long-deceased owner, kept by a witch as an unearthly guide. While these spooky items are horrifying to us, they have all been used as everyday tools of the witch's trade for hundreds of years. Along with these come more familiar tools, like these soothsaying teacups. For the advanced witch, another way to read the future was by dripping molten lead into water. The future this metal saw was the man in question would be in a car wreck. Three weeks later, he was. But thanks to the forewarning, he'd been wearing his seatbelt and survived. The witches are keen to show they are not all intent on harm. For many, their ghoulish image has to give way to earning a living. This is old Nick, a wish box skull. Place your wish in his mouth, pay the witch, and let old Nick chew it over till it comes true. The warlock who owned this skull cup toured crowded pubs selling magic potions concocted inside it. Another witch received large sums for these giant bottles of spirits. However, there's not a drop of hard liquor inside, but sinister spirits trapped forever by their witch masters. 
The perception of witches was often formed unwittingly as they tried to do good. A local farmer with a mouse problem became scared when one well-meaning witch placed this charm jar containing the jelly corpse of a mouse in his barn. Within hours, his farm was rid of the plague, and due to the farmer's fear, the town was rid of the witch. Although most witches today practice safe hex, there have always been wicked witches. This photograph was found behind an office filing cabinet. When the boss ran away with his beautiful secretary, his jealous wife paid a witch to pin more than just the blame on her. It's no coincidence the secretary had to retire due to back problems. Jealousy also inspired this talisman, a stiletto shoe containing a mummified wax-covered sparrow. Discovered under the slates of a nearby house, it was said the sacrifice of the sparrow would herald the death of another beautiful creature, the pretty girl who lived there. Another employer's wife planted this in a new girl's desk, a doll with pens through her heart, hands and feet tied, condemned to an eternally loveless future for a crime she never had the chance to commit. These witch-cursed puppets often promoted fearful deaths. This well-to-do lady enraged her best friend, who then cast a deadly spell on her. On a full moon, this poppet was left outside her house. Inside, the woman was discovered slowly bleeding to death. While these witches are ostensibly modern, much of Graham's work is still conducted under a witch's moon. Tonight, they're tying peace charms they've blessed to local trees. Even past witching hour, Graham and John visit sites where their ancient craft has been performed for centuries. Celts carved this symbol of the labyrinth maze into this rock nearly two millennia ago. According to Graham, the kind of power modern witchcraft generates is still felt and needed, particularly in today's workplace. I think there's probably more need for it now than ever. There's uh, every, every um, business you can think of, every profession you can think of, you'll find the witches and the druids and the pagans are amongst them. Often these new converts join them to practice the ancient ritual of bull roaring here on the desolate clifftops of Cornwall. The unearthly sound created is believed to summon up spirits from the surrounding rocks and from the depths of the sea and heighten a witch's power. After years of persecution, this quiet coven is finally able to practice in peace. Would you believe it? This is Amherst, Massachusetts, a respectable college town. But this is a town with a secret. Although this may look like the type of place where students go quietly about their scholarly business, the truth is this college town doesn't just have skeletons in its closet, but fossils in the basement. It is surprising enough that this small college has a world-renowned museum of natural history, but even more surprising is what they keep beneath the museum, down in the basement. This is the most unique collection of dinosaur artifacts in the world. The person who put this collection together, however, had never even heard of dinosaurs, and when he was told of them, still didn't believe in them. This is one of the most important fossil discoveries in North America. It was found by a New England farmer named Pliny Moody near his home in South Hadley, Massachusetts in 1802. Moody had been plowing his father's field when he turned up this stone slab. Unaware of the importance of his discovery, he installed it as a doorstep and went back to plowing his field. Thirty-three years later, residents of Greenfield, Massachusetts, noticed that their paving slabs, quarried from nearby Turner's Falls, appeared to be covered by the tracks of a turkey. Local physician Dr. James Dean documented these turkey tracks and contacted Edward B. Hitchcock, professor of natural theology and geology here at Amherst College. Hitchcock was hooked. He devoted the rest of his life to scouring the Connecticut Valley, collecting more and more examples of what he thought were the tracks of prehistoric birds. This broken rectangle of stone is one of the most astonishing pieces of the collection. It was actually used as a section of sidewalk. When it was turned up, more than 50 years after being laid down, it was discovered that the underside had seen far more ancient pedestrians. This fascinating exhibit gives an insight into how the imprints were laid down. As the silt and mud turned to rock, it did so in layers. When these layers are separated, the prints permeate through. The top layers are casts, where later mud filled in the footprints, and the lower layers show where the weight of the creature pressed down into the mud. 
Hitchcock needed to test his theory that these tracks were made by turkeys, so he killed one, then planted its foot in clay to see if the result was similar to his fossilized discoveries. It was, with one main exception. The turkey that left these footprints would have had to have been about 12 feet tall. Hitchcock was enthralled. He wrote about these huge creatures. One feels sure that many of them were peculiar and gigantic, and I have experienced all the excitement of romance as I have gone back into those immensely remote ages. I have seen in scientific vision an apterous bird some 12 or 15 feet high, nay, large flocks of them walking over the muddy surface. Hitchcock's vision, however, was under threat from radicals who subscribed to the new theory of the age, evolution. Some people even said the tracks had been made by giant lizards that they were calling dinosaurs. But Hitchcock stuck to his story. They were made by turkeys, giant ones. Hitchcock died in 1864, believing that he had discovered and cataloged a whole race of giant birds that stalked the earth in prehistoric times. In his final work, he admitted, however, the real question is not whether these hypotheses accord with our religious views, but whether they are true. Sadly, even by the time he died, Hitchcock's theories had been proven untrue. The radicals had won the day. The footprints were not made by giant turkeys, but dinosaurs. Ironically, recent theories suggest that Hitchcock's birds and what we know as dinosaurs are closely linked by evolution. Unfortunately for Hitchcock, he didn't believe in that either. Cornwall is one of England's most far-flung counties. Stuck out into the Atlantic Ocean, it has always considered itself separate from the rest of the country, which perhaps explains its ambivalent attitude towards one of its most traditional occupations, a way of life that many consider to be Cornwall's oldest profession, smuggling. In a land where nowhere is far from a hidden section of coastline, bringing ashore illicit goods was always possible, if not easy. Close-knit communities provided the necessary network for distributing the goods once they were on land. However much it was a way of life, taking away the king's revenue was always frowned upon by the authorities. So the smugglers of Cornwall undertook a daily game of cat and mouse with his majesty's customs inspectors. A game where the penalty for getting caught was severe indeed, death. Gibbets, swinging with a rotting corpse or two of freshly deceased freelance importers, were a common sight on the Cornish landscape. In order to escape this rather unfortunate curtailment to their activities, the smugglers had to resort to more and more ingenious methods. If it was too dangerous for a ship laden with illegal barrels of liquor to come ashore, the barrels would be thrown into the sea, weighted down, of course. The smugglers would then wait for a dark night and use hooks, like this one, to drag up the barrels and land them safely. And in case the barrels should ever be checked, they were designed to avoid detection. Just like the smuggler's cover story, the main compartment held water. Out of reach of the long arm of the law was smuggled brandy. On land, the supply network had its own cunning methods. This hand would be placed in a shop window. Palm out had nothing to sell. But turned the other way, this ring told customers that a new shipment had come in. This stick was a perfect disguise. Left in a bundle of firewood, no customs inspector would suspect its use, unless they tried to throw it on the fire. Then its rather explosive cargo might have been discovered, spirits smuggled over from Europe. Nowadays, some of Cornwall's most curious smuggling relics have been gathered together here at Jamaica Inn on Bodmin Moor. Smuggling secrets are exposed here, like this, a common method of smuggling exotic birds from Europe to England. Items of clothing are a favorite hiding place, like this corset, which held in more than its owner. When customs inspectors noticed a man with a limp, they opened up the heel of his shoe to discover a false compartment. The lady who wore this headdress was making more than a fashion statement. She was hoping to make a bundle of money from her travels. Unfortunately, she was caught with several packages of illegal narcotics. The customs officer who peeked under her skirt got another unexpected surprise. More drugs in test tubes, accessorized with a colorful garter. Ever wondered if you have the right time? This man certainly didn't. Unfortunately, his cunningly adapted vest didn't fool the inspectors. And now he's doing time at Her Majesty's convenience. This life jacket was designed to save lives, but a sailor put it to what he hoped would be a more profitable use, 
Unfortunately, it couldn't save him once its illegal hiding places were discovered. This crucifix certainly didn't offer salvation to its wearer. Inside were illegal drugs. The smuggler was found dead of an overdose in a Cairo hotel. This sports car was used for years by international drug smugglers until its secret was finally discovered when customs officials found extra compartments welded to the fuel tank. And this oil can used the same technique as the ancient barrels. A small compartment held oil to fool customs, but the rest of the can hid whatever the smuggler wanted to bring into the country. In the glove compartment, this guidebook held travel advice and also hundreds of thousands of dollars of jewels. This magnificent beast is the descendant of one of the most bizarre hiding places now on display at the Smuggler's Museum. For many years, this turtle was mounted on the wall in the captain's cabin of a large ship. Until one day, the captain's smuggling enterprise went belly up when the turtle fell off the wall to reveal its secret double life. Perhaps it just didn't have the stomach for a life of crime. <laughs> Would you believe it? Is this a cupboard or an office desk? And is this just a chair? Or the wheel off an old wagon? Wharton Escherich, the man who made them, was never a man for convention. As a boy growing up in West Philadelphia, he would often get up before dawn so he could sketch the milkman's horse. And as a student, he quit his art academy in protest against having to paint in the styles of his teachers. Then as an artist, he ignored the trends and fashions for 50 years to become one of the century's foremost, but little known, artist craftsmen. After marrying Letitia, 25-year-old Wharton and his bride moved to this serene Pennsylvania hillside. Letty and Wharton had come to Paoli, just outside Philadelphia, to escape the city and to be closer to nature. After a series of jobs as a trained printer had come to nothing, Wharton decided to come here to concentrate and devote all his time to his painting. Over the years, he painted many landscapes and portraits, like this self-portrait completed when he was 32. Living in the cottage surrounded by woodland, the young couple lived a bohemian lifestyle. They grew their own food, joined avant-garde theater groups, and became involved with like-minded artists. They made their own clothes and often decided not to use them. But a quiet life in their woodland sanctuary was just what the couple had been looking for. This is Wharton's portrait of their daughter, Mary. When Wharton spent some time at an artist colony in 1919, someone suggested he start carving designs into the frames of his paintings. After this, Wharton cut his first wood blocks and was soon attempting ever more complicated designs like this one. Wharton was expressing himself and his ideas far more confidently and at a greater rate in his carving than he felt he ever could in his painting. Besides carving wood blocks, he was also honing his sculpture, developing his skills on these small pieces. In 1926, Wharton stopped painting altogether and proclaimed, if I can't paint like Escherich, I can at least sculpt like Escherich. From that day until he died in 1970, Wharton spent every waking hour sculpting wood. Here, in Escherich's beloved woodland home, just some of his creations have been collected in a fascinating museum. When Wharton built his wooden house, he certainly went against the grain. Just as Wharton's designs always had a twist, so did his roof. Today, architects come here to study these bending beams. When Wharton designed his workshop, he literally dug it into the side of the hill. His workshop floor was originally just bare mud. He wanted to be surrounded and inspired by nature. All the wood used here was gathered from the woods on the hillside. These wooden doors were constructed so he could drag his enormous sculptures outside to work on them. This wooden case was designed to suggest the feeling of looking up through trees. In his quiet corner office, Wharton would sit building miniatures or creating woodblock drawings, but he'd never sit for long. This dramatic staircase which twists its way to the upper floor, was unbolted to be exhibited at the 1940 New York World Fair. Its elegant curves lead us up to Wharton's bedroom and library. This secret trap door leads to the bedroom. One tug on this monkey and revealed behind it is one of the most tranquil rooms in the house. 
with wide expanses of bare wood, the bedroom itself was designed to blur the line between the woodland outside and his most personal space. He built his bed at window height, letting him experience the woodland day or night. His modern kitchen equipment blends seamlessly with the wooden shelves, curving around into a dining area with, of course, woodland views. Every surface was labored over. If it was wood, Wharton could lovingly fashion it into his home. The intricate floor design is a patchwork of scrap given to him by a local lumber merchant. Nothing went to waste in Wharton's house. This chair, for example, is made from handles from the many worn out axes he used every day to create his work. And when he reused wagon wheels to build this chair, he proved what goes around really does come around. Wharton loved his home. Here he could create in peace while avoiding the pressures of the world and most unwanted visitors. Despite his awareness of changing trends, the emergence of the Bauhaus and Art Deco, the world at large was still unaware of him. Many of his friends asked him to put on more exhibitions and sell for a higher price simply to attract attention. But Wharton wasn't interested in leaving his home. He was content just doing his work. To his friends who couldn't understand him, he once said, if you want to know who I am, look at my work. In later years, he built this studio close to the house, and he worked here almost every day right up to his death, aged 83. During his life, he'd produced over 400 wood blocks, created hundreds of sculptures and pieces of furniture. However little known he remains today, after producing so many beautiful and moving sculptures, Wharton Escherich has also carved himself a place in history. Would you believe it?